and shall have part of the inheritance among the brethren. The finding pot is for silver, and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. Whoso mocketh the poor reproacheth his maker, and he that is glad at calamity shall not be unpunished. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Excellent speech becometh not a fool, much less do lying lips a prince. A gift is as precious a gift is as a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. Whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. But he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. A reproof entereth more into a wise man than an hundred stripes into a fool. An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. Let a bear robbed, let a bear robbed of her whelps meet a man rather than a fool in his folly. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water, therefore leave off contention before it be meddled with. He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A man void of understanding striketh hands, and become a surety in the presence of his friend. He loveth transgression that loveth strife, and he that exalteth his gate seeketh destruction. He that hath a froward heart findeth no good, and he that hath a perverse tongue falleth into mischief. He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. A wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. Wisdom is before him that hath understanding, but the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth. A foolish son is as grief to his father, and bitterness to her that bear him. Also to punish the just is not good, nor to strike princes for equity. He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool, when he, is, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Brother Doug, could you pray for us? All right, amen. Proverbs chapter 17. Look at verse number 1 here. Proverbs 17, verse number 1. Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Now, a dry morsel, he's talking about food. And he's not, the, he's not talking about the best food. He's talking about just a little bit of food. Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with with strife. He's saying it's better to live in peace than to live in abundance, but be in strife about it, to have contention. On a, you know, it's better to have peace at home than to live and have an abundance of riches. In Ecclesiastes 4, he says, better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. So Ecclesiastes, he makes this same comparison to this verse, and he, com he compares the house full of strife, he compares it to vexation of the Spirit. If you've, you know, Somebody that's vexed in the Spirit, you can see it. You can see the depression, you can see their beat down, you can see their war out. And he's trying to tell us something here that, you know, there's more to life than just riches. There's more to life than just the appearance. A lot of the people that live in the fanciest neighborhoods and drive the fanciest cars and, you know, you think they're married to the, fancy, the, the best person, they're not. They're not happy. They're, they're not content. It's full of strife. There's no love in the house. And he's, he's trying to give us an example here that sometimes we're better just to be satisfied with what we have, to be content with what we have. You know, especially in life, especially with marriage, you know, because here talking about a house full of strife. You know, I've seen 
families where it's just they're, they're constantly arguing and that starts with mom and dad. That's the beginning of the problem. And you know, a lot of times people will marry each other for the wrong reasons. You know, maybe one marries for appearance, maybe another marries for wealth and they're not happy. They're not marrying for love. They're not doing it in a godly way and they end up with a house full of strife. They may have all the sacrifices, they may have all the food and clothing and cars and all those things in this world, but they are not happy. It's a vexed life. They're, they're dissatisfied with life. In Proverbs 19, he says, A foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. You know, like a noise that just won't go away. If you marry the wrong person for the wrong reason, it's a problem that will affect you for the rest of your life. In Proverbs 21, he says, It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. Like, there are guys that go home and they're scared of their wife. They're scared she's going to yell at them. They're scared she's going to you know, beat them up or throw something at them. Or maybe, maybe it's just physical. Maybe it's not physical abuse, rather. Maybe it's mental. Maybe it's psychological abuse where there are women out there that will just beat up a guy. And you know what? That guy married her for a reason. Probably the wrong reason. And you know, now he has a house full of strife. I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3. As Christians, we need to be content with what God has given us and not worry about having a house full of riches because those that are after that, they will end up with a house full of strife. Yeah. People that are, I mean, that have everything, they have everything except happiness. They are not happy. They are not content. And when he says better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith, quietness is dealing with peace. Just being at calm. Having, you know, when the night is over and you can let you can rest, it's quiet in the house. And that's the way it ought to be. When a city is at peace and they have security, and the Bible describes that as a city that's at quiet. The city is quiet. There's no commotion. There's no tumults. There's no wars outside of the gate. They have quietness. They have security. They have peace. And that ought to be the goal is to have peace in your house with your children, with your family. To have peace with one another. And the world doesn't even look at that. They just look at, I want this type of house, this type of wall, this type of roof, this type of car. I want this type of family. I want designer clothes. And they never sit down and think about the substance or the character of the individuals that they would like to have in their family. And listen, character doesn't happen by accident. We have to train up our children. As Christians, he says that we should study to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your own hands. You know, being quiet is a good thing. And I'm not just talking about holding your peace or not speaking up. Having, um, uh, you know, meditating on the Word of God is a good thing. And quietness in your house is good. You're in 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to look at this about a house full of quietness rather than strife. Look at verse number 1. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. He's saying, ladies, you should be a lady. You should serve your husband as God has made you to be in subjection to your husband. And listen, everybody answers to somebody. Sometimes, well, that's no fair. How come he, he has to answer, you know, I have to answer to him. Well, hey, he answers to God for you and for the family, and for the provision. So don't ever compare yourself or say, well, that's not fair. And, and today, I mean, feminism is destroying families. Feminism is just, it, it's disgusting what it's turning out. The way, that, the way that little girls are acting today, they're not acting like ladies. And wives don't want to be in subjection. Rather, they want their husbands to be in subjection. They want, they want a fair balance, but yet we're not made the same way. We're not made with the same purpose. So God here is saying that as Christians, He says that wives should be in subjection to their husband. For the sake, especially if you know, a wife could get a husband saved that is not, by doing it God's way, by obeying God. And look at verse number 2. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear... Now he's saying, while they behold. So when people see a wife, a lady, that's in the fear of God, that chaste conversation. Conversation is dealing with your walk. That is your lifestyle, your walk and your talk. And they're seeing it in the fear of the Lord. So 
people can this is talking about lifestyle evangelism if you will now obviously that we don't we don't practice that except hey yeah we should practice a lifestyle of obedience and obeying god and people will see that and we'll see the fear of god he says in verse three whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning or plating of hair or wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel he's saying true beauty isn't just putting on jewelry it's not just putting on fancy clothing right and you know it says in proverbs 31 that favor is deceitful and beauty is vain but a woman that feareth the lord she shall be praised the bible is teaching that true beauty is on the inside true beauty isn't about having all the makeup having the hair just right having the jewelry having that certain piece of clothing and unfortunately we judge by appearance jesus said we judge unrighteous judgment because we judge by what we can see and that affects us in the flesh. And he's warning us here that a beautiful woman is somebody who is adorned not outwardly. It's not about what you look like to the world. Look at verse 4. He gives us the, the insight here. He says, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And listen, we're not oppressive to women. Oh, you women need to stay quiet all the time. No, he's talking about, hey, being meek and quiet, being humble, being in subjection to your husband. It should not be that a woman is over-talking her husband or bossing her husband. There should always be a time that she is subject to, hey, okay, whatever you say. You know, listening to the advice that he gives. And God gives us godly women for a reason, and the, godly, the godliness should be apparent not by the outward adorning, he says, but the hidden man of the heart. In that which is not corruptible. Your spirit, your soul, it's not corruptible. If you're saved, let it, let it show. Just let it show by even when it's not easy, subjecting yourself to the will of God. Having that ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. And today in 2019, being meek and being quiet are not characteristics that anybody brags about. But in the Bible, those have always been characteristic. God bragged about Moses, about how meek he was, about how humble he was. Now Moses, he was able to lead a crowd. He was able to get loud. He was bold in the face of adversity, but yet he was meek toward God. He was humble. He was a real person. He wasn't being puffed up. He wasn't insincere. And today most people are not meek and quiet, but as Christians, that's the way, if you want peace at home, it's going to start by having that meek, and quiet spirit. Verse number five. For after this manner in the old times, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands. Here's why it's hard because are you trusting in God or are you trusting in yourself? No, look, he's saying these are saved ladies, right? These, these women, they're saved, but it wasn't just that, well, I have to trust my husband. Hey, why don't you just trust God and obey your husband? Because that's what he said. If you trust God that he will see fit to take care of you, then it's easier to be in subjection to somebody else that's over you. Verse 6, he says, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Go back to Proverbs chapter 17. So he's talking about being godly, having a, a perfect life. God wants to help you have a peaceful household, and it's teamwork. I mean, the men have a job just as much as the ladies. In 1 Timothy 2, he says that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And that's the way a Christian household ought to be. Quiet, peaceable, godly, honesty. Those are characteristics that we need to value above, you know, the braggadocious world. You know, everybody's just swole up, look at me, look at my skill, look what I can do. Everybody needs to know my name. Well, that's not godly. You know, God, <laughs> we need to fear God and obey God. And if that means that we're, our friends won't think we're as cool, well, then that's okay. Because it's not about popularity. It's not about what people think. It's about having the fear of the Lord, and then He will provide that security, that calmness, by giving us a peaceful household. Verse number two in Proverbs, look at this, Proverbs 17, verse number two. He says, a wise servant shall have rule over a son that causeth shame and shall have part of the inheritance among the brethren. I've seen this more than one time in businesses where the business owner, they despise what their children have become. 
how, how ingrate, uh, ungrateful they are for things. They are an ingrate. They, they don't appreciate it. They don't work hard. They think they are entitled to something. And instead, they take a good worker, somebody that has been a good servant, that have worked with them for years, and then to end up giving them part of their company or all of their company. I've seen this several times in life where people were able to acquire a company just because they were the best worker. They were the best worker. They took it like, I am the servant. I'll obey everything. I'll even do the worst job. And the owner looked at it like, well, this is the only person that's keeping the place together. This is the only person that cares enough to run it like it's their own business. As Christians, we need to be a wise servant instead of this son that causeth shame. That causeth shame, right? Because the goal here is to have a peaceful house. In Proverbs 29, it says, He that delicately, delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. Sometimes there are people that are more like family than your actual family. Sometimes family gets just so separated because they're so selfish that you can't trust them anymore. You don't want to work around them. You can't stand seeing them. And it's sad. As Christians, we want to keep our family together. Even extended family. You know, we all have probably extended family where we, we wonder if they're saved or we know for a fact that they're not saved or we see their, their bad lifestyle or their bad works or their bad doctrine. And, you know, we want to correct that. We want to fix them. But there comes a point when, well, they know where I'm, where I'm at and I know where they're at. So now I just need to be at peace with them. Now, I, you know, that doesn't mean you go hang out with them and support them in their sin. But you, there, you, know, you can just be at peace and trust the Lord and fear the Lord and make sure, okay, you know where I'm at, so when you're ready, I'm here. When you're ready, I can help you. Look at verse 3. He says, The fining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. A fining pot is to take the dross out of the silver, right? The furnace is for gold. You melt the gold, you get rid of the trash, you get rid of the junk, and it makes the gold better. It makes the silver more pure. But God says here, the Lord trieth the hearts. Why does God try us? To make us better. To perfect us. Right? Just as he's talking about finding this silver, making it more fine, making it more pure, God will allow us to go through things sometimes just to make us better, to make us more perfect. He will refine you, and He does it by looking at your heart, seeing where you're at, seeing what you can handle, and putting you through a situation that will help you change your priorities. It will help you perfect and you know, leave certain things behind and you know, press toward other things. In 1 Chronicles 28 of Solomon, he says, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. Right? So he says here, The Lord trieth the hearts. Why is it? that we have so many, so many uh, uh, Proverbs from Solomon. And we have the book of Ecclesiastes. We have all these great things. Now, Solomon was far from a perfect person. But Solomon learned something from his father, and that was his heart, his attitude toward the Lord. He says he has a perfect heart, a willing mind. He says, For the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. There are people today, you know, I, I think those that end up reprobate, it's because in their mind they want to pretend like there is no God. They know there's a God. They are without excuse. It's evident to them, and it's like they want to ignore it. It's like they, they know the truth, and they want to reject it. They want to get rid of it. And in the same way, Christians will pretend like, well, it's not that bad. I can get away with this. God, God won't, you know, destroy my life over it. Or I've seen other Christians, Christians that do it, so I can do certain things. But the Lord will refine you from your heart. He says, the Lord trieth the hearts. What I was reading in 1 Chronicles 28, he says, the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. That was the warning given to Solomon. That was the promise and the warning that God sees your heart. He knows your intentions. He knows your thoughts. Consider that because the Lord trieth the hearts. In Hebrews 4, he says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the dividing of sunder of the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Bible is used by God to help you discern your own thoughts and intents. God sees and knows what you're thinking. You can't say, well, I meant to do that. No, God, know, God knows what you meant to do. God knows what you did in private. God knows what you thought in private. And He judges the hearts. He tries the hearts just as if you would take a piece of silver, 
or a piece of gold and put it through the fire and put it through the furnace to make it better. So when you're going through a tough time, when you're going through a situation and you wander and you're in prayer, Lord, why me? Why this? How am I supposed to get through this? Just consider that chunk of silver. Imagine digging up a chunk of silver in your yard. You say, wow, this is great, except there's some slag in there. I got a little bit of dross, and then this thing would be great. That's how God looks at us. He says, hey, I'm going to try your heart. I'm going to purify you. I'm going to help you be refined and perfect you. Look at verse number 6 here, Proverbs 17, verse number 6. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Now when he says children's children, those are grandchildren. And he says that's the crown of old men. It is a crown to an old man to get to the point of being a grandfather, and, be, and for it to be evident that you have successfully raised a child, that is now able to raise another child, right? There is evidence of, of good instruction. It is a crown when you can look at the next generation. It is a crown if your parents can look at you and say, well, I guess I did all right, and you're, you guys are doing all right. Like you're, it's like you're passing the torch. And he's saying, grandchildren are the crown of old men. A crown, a glory, is something to be honored. You know, that ought to be the goal of all of us, as, as young as we are, to be able to, when we get you know, 20, 40 years down the road to be able to say, the next generation is better off because I stood my ground on the principles that mattered. I didn't compromise. The next generation, my children's children, are better because I refused to compromise with the devil. I said, no, we're not going to allow this. No, we won't do that. We're going to take a stand. We're going to do it right. We were willing to sacrifice, even when it hurts, for the sake of the children's children. That's how it becomes a crown, because there are people today that when you see a, a divorced grandma that is with their daughter's child, and they're angry at the child, and they're carrying the child around all the time, it's like, well, how did you end up that way? It's because there was no good instruction. When you see how the world is so broken, and families are being destroyed, and you have people that are watching grandchildren, well, where's that other child at? Then it's not a crown. Then it's evident, well, you're raising that one? We didn't do so good with the other one. We had some hillbillies that <laughs> installed some windows in our house. And uh, this guy, I mean, he was a piece. He was something else. He was a redneck. He was a hillbilly. Call him whatever you want. I mean, he was, and he knew it. He would have told you he was. And apparently it was a family crew because his daughter of about 30-some years old, who was just as redneck, was working with him. And he starts, when he sees our daughter, he's like, oh, I'm going to take her. Oh, she's beautiful. I'd love to have her. And I'm like, no, you're not. I see what you did to that one. No, you're not. You ruined that one. You're not taking mine. We're going to treat her a little bit better than that. He laughed about it, but I was serious. I'm like, no, you ruined your daughter. You know, and he was complaining about her the whole time, about how now she's back in his house and she's left so-and-so again and she's back and, she's, and she was just as mouthy and rude and crude. And I'm thinking, well, you failed. You have failed when your children are coming back to live in your house at the age of 30 and they're vulgar and disgusting and where's the next generation? They're being destroyed because of selfishness. However, we, we should be selfless and we should sacrifice and we should have the goal of having children's children that are a crown, that are something you can brag about. Look at the second half of this verse. He says, And the glory of children are their fathers. The glory of children are their fathers. You know, a lot of children, they, they like bragging on their fathers. They look forward to daddy gets home, my daddy this, my daddy that. You know, and, and you know, glory here, he's talking about splendor. He, he, bragging rights. When your child can brag about my dad can do this, my dad loves me, gave me that, whatever, fill in the blank, right? So for children, it says the glory of children are their fathers. Now this is a big responsibility. This is big shoes to fill. This is not something that should be taken lightly. Our children should be able to brag on us that we're doing things right. That we're doing things right. That we're not soon angry. That we're not always away from the house and never home. That we don't care enough to try to instruct them and teach them. And you know, this word glory here, I want you to, I'm going to look at the word glory in the application where he says, the glory of children are their fathers. The glory of children, that's like bragging rights. That's something that's splendid. That's something that makes something else more beautiful. In Psalm 19 it says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. 
How do we know how glorious God is that we can't see? Well, he gives us a small description by looking at the heavens. When you look at the heavens and you see just how amazing it is, how complex it is, how beautiful it is, that is a glory to God. Right? Well, that's how it ought to be with children to a father. We ought, or your children ought to be able to look at you dads and say, wow, amazing. In John 11 of Jesus, it was really, he says, therefore his sisters went unto him, this is of Lazarus, and he said, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. When you have a sickness, when you have a problem, when you have an infirmity in life, maybe it's for the glory of God. Maybe it's something that God wants to use as bragging rights to say, look what God can do. Look what God can get me through. Think about it. Because that's hard when, you, when you're down. When you're, I mean, think about Job. Job maintained the right attitude, and we need to consider that. And we're going through a rough time. It might be not for our own glory, because we would lose glory at that. It's like, hey, it's not for my glory. It's for God's glory. Let God put me through this to try me and get me better. In Philippians 2, he says that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right? Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What's the glory of God the Father? That people would confess that Jesus is God, that He is our Lord, that He is our Savior, that salvation comes through Him. That glorifies the Father. That's speaking well of God the Father. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In Psalm 62, it says, In God is my salvation and my glory. So, as human beings, our glory is God. Something we have, we can look at, look at what God can do. Not just look at me, but look at God through me. He says, In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my salvation and my refuge, is in God. The glory of a saved person is God. Amen. That's what's glorious. Yeah. Not what I have, not, you know, I, I've seen it where, let me tell you all the weird, weird things I did in my life, all the wickedness, all the sin. No, why don't you glorify God? Right. You know, we go out preaching the gospel, not to brag about what we have overcome in the flesh, but to say what Jesus Christ has overcome for us, to tell what God the Father has done. The glory of the saved person is God. In Galatians 6, he says, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I shouldn't go around bragging and boasting of anything except the Lord Jesus Christ. We have bragging rights in the cross, in Jesus, in salvation. In 2 Corinthians 10, he says, but he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse number 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Now this is an interesting statement here. God is saying, how do we know how glorious God is? Well, look what he has created. Look at mankind. Right? So God here, he's not just pointing at the heavens to say, look at my power. He points at us. Right? Now he's not saying... You know, get proud of yourself or your accomplishments. He's saying, look how amazing a human being is because God has created you. And so God is glorified through mankind. But, he, but the second half, he says, the woman is the glory of a man. The woman is the glory of a man. You, you, know what, you want to know a family that's working well together? When you see a guy that seems to have his stuff together, guess what? There's a woman behind the scenes that's taking care of business and helping him, a faithful man is glorified by a virtuous woman. She is complimented and he's refined. A, a faithful man is refined and perfected when God gives him a virtuous woman. And too many times, you know, the man will get puffed up. Well, look what I've accomplished. Hey, buddy, your wife's at home. She's raising the kids. She's feeding you. She's taking care of business. She's cleaning up. She's doing all these other difficult tasks that you are prepared to do, mentally equipped to do, whatever it is. She's helping take care of business. So when God says here in verse 7 that the woman is the glory of a man, that's not just saying your wife is arm candy. That's saying she has your back, that she has your mind. She is there to give you wise counsel, that she can, we can together as a family, we ought to glorify God. In Proverbs 31 of the virtuous woman, it says, She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. 
right? That's when a man is glorified, when he has a woman like that. He says, her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. That verse in Proverbs 31, it's all about the woman. She rises early. She does this work. She takes care of the food. She takes care of the kid, right? She, she does, she does, she does, she does. And then it says, her husband is known in the gates. You notice that? Because of, of, of how, how virtuous she is, she helps him to take care of business. He's known in the gates. He's known in the city. He's among the elders of the land. He's right there with the leaders because he has a good woman getting his back. So when it says that the, the, the woman is the glory of the man, that's, that's a good thing. That's, that is an awesome thing. This is God's perfect plan. That's, what, that's something that's glorious is when you see a man and a woman working together to serve God. Look at verse number 3 in this chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 3, back up to that verse. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Guess what? The universe has pecking order. All right? There's the Father, and He has sent the Son. Christ is our Savior. He's the Redeemer of all men, right? He is the only way to get to heaven. And I love the fact here that it says He's the head of every man. The head of every man is Christ. Now listen, if you're not saved, some I've heard, well, then he's not really the head. No, if you're not saved, you're in rebellion. You have disobeyed the gospel. Guess what? That unsaved reprobate that wants to live in the gutter and hates God, Christ is still his head. He's just in disobedience, right? Christ died for all men. He paid for all sins. So when he says here, the head of every man is Christ, well, guess what? Men... You have a head, you have a boss, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to work for Him as He worked for the Father. He, he, he has given you the Holy Spirit as the Father gave it to Him, and He's given us instruction here. But He goes on, He says, The head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So again, the woman has a head. It's called man. Man has a head. That's Jesus. Look at verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Well, now, who's his head? Christ. That's right. Thank you. Some of y'all are paying attention. All right? So if I were to be in here, and I said, well, look, I've got this little Jewish skull cap, and I'm going to put it on my head, so we're going to pray, and I'm going to prophesy, I'm going to preach with this little Jewish uh, get-up, who would I be dishonoring if I did that? Jesus Christ. That's right. Now listen, if you want to wear a ball cap in the building, I'm not going to tell you to take it off. But if you want to pray or prophesy, the Bible's saying you should, you should have your head uncovered. Now, there's also the definition here, and we're going to get to that. Look at this in verse 5. He says, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Now, who is her head? Her husband. Her husband. Thank you. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. So here we're not talking about a ball cap. We're not talking about a doily. We're not talking about one of those Mennonite bonnets. Right? We're talking about her hair. Look at verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. So if a woman has long hair, it's glorious. It's a good thing. It's something you could have bragging rights on. It's something that makes her look better. And she's honoring her head, which according to the Bible, who is her head? The man, her husband. Look at verse 5 again. He says, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. <coughs> For that is even as all she were shaven. He's saying, hey, if you're going to, listen, ladies, you want to pray? You want to go out preaching the gospel? Don't shave your head, is what it's saying. Don't go out with a short, you know, Joyce Meyer dyke haircut. You know, don't go out with, you know, Ellen DeGenerate, the, the uh, Kabbalist, the Jewish mystical lesbian pervert that's polluting the minds of the people today. Yeah. That short-haired freak. Well, that's what Joyce Meyer wants to look like. Not only is it an abomination that Joyce Meyer would get behind a pulpit and claim to be a prophet of God, but it's an abomination that she has short hair. 
The Bible clearly says that a woman has long hair. It is a glory for her. And if she doesn't have hair, she might as well be shaving or shorn. If she wants to go around with a, a man's haircut, she might as well shave it all off like a chemo patient. She might as well. Think about it. Her hair is given her for a covering. And it says she shouldn't be preaching or prophesying or praying with that covering. Sure. <coughs> yeah, not to mention she has pants on. She's such an abomination. Joyce Meyer, Ellen Degenerate. You know, I call her Ellen Degenerate. Right? Does anybody know what a, everybody know what a degenerate is? Oh, yeah. Right? Fitting. It's very fitting. I want to read the definition of a degenerate. Having lost the physical, mental, or moral qualities considered normal and desirable, showing evidence of decline. The Ellen Show, showing evidence of decline. Having lost moral qualities. She's a pervert. She's a weirdo. She's defiling children in the minds of Americans. Ellen DeGeneres, her and Joyce Meyer, and all these other short hair, I mean, Miley Cyrus, put them all in the same group. Do you understand? Joyce Meyer might as well just act like, like Miley Cyrus. They all, they're all the same in God's eyes. Joyce Meyer is not saved. She preaches a false gospel. She has short hair, which according to the Bible is not glorious. In fact, she is an abomination. Look at verse number 6. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Just like, it, like Miley Cyrus. Like I said, you might as well shave it and look like a freak. Joyce Meyer, if you're going to wear your hair short and pray to God in public and teach women to do the same thing, you might as well join the, the Hollywood weirdos. Verse number seven, he says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. For as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of a man. So it goes back to teaching that. The woman is the glory of the man, but a man should not cover his head. Now in context, if a woman is covered, because she has long hair instead of shaving it off, then it says the man should not be covered that way. He should not have long hair is what he's teaching. Look at verse 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Right? She was a rib. <laughs> Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. She was created to be a helper to Adam, right? So your wife is there to help you, and the husband is not there to be a glory to the wife. It's the opposite. Look at verse 13. Judging yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? You ever wondered why when you see Joyce Meyer on the TV, you just hate watching her? Because that's what this verse is saying. It's uncomely. It's, it's not natural. That's weird for a woman to look like that, act like that, not to mention her plastic surgery, but then to claim to be a prophet of God. Look at verse 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Well, now, you've got to delete that out of your Bible. Most people don't like that. That guy that was in here the other uh, couple weeks back now that had long hair and a beard and he was trying to be all holy. Like he was saying he achieved sinless perfection and he's so much like God that he even made the comment about himself about having a beard and long hair as if he were like Jesus. And, he, and I'm like, yeah, you're trying to be like a God. It's blasphemous what he was teaching, the doctrine he was teaching, and he was boasting of his long hair. It's like, don't you know the Bible? It's a shame for a man to have long hair. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? You know, it's funny. Just today, there's a house down the street from us that caught fire. They've been repairing it. I turn on the street, and there's a city truck there. I say, oh, they must be doing an inspection, moving on, getting to the next level. And then I see, it's like, I see long hair, and I'm like, that's either a dude with long hair, or that's a really ugly chick. And if it's a really ugly chick, why is she being an inspector for the city checking the joists of a roof? Like, wouldn't they send a dude for that? You would think, right? Well, it was a really, it was an ugly dude. It was a dude with long hair, and he was ugly. He had a beard. But at first, all I could see was the hair from half a block away. And I'm like, uh-uh-uh. He's got the hair of a woman, but he's a man. Does not nature even teach you it's a shame? It's unnatural? When you start looking, oh, that's hair. Oh, that's a dude. That's not a woman. 
Why are you acting like a woman? That's a shame. That's disgusting. It's weird. If a woman have long hair, look at verse 15. If a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. So that's that covering that a woman ought to have while she's praying. In other words, ladies, keep your hair long and keep praying. Keep preaching the gospel. But if a man, if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. If you want to argue about men having long hair or it's okay for a woman to, to jack all of her hair off and do it short, we don't have that. No, that's contentious. We don't have that custom. Go somewhere else. Go, to, go back to Proverbs chapter 17. So here he, he teaches us that the woman is the glory of the man and that the hair is the glory of a woman. And when a lady has her hair long, the man is glorified because she's in order. That Christ is glorified because the man has the woman in order. So there's an order, and if everything is in order, it is a glorious thing. Yep. And listen, as Christians, our goal is to have a, a good house, to raise up our children and say, son, cut your hair. Daughter, let it grow long. That's glorious. Ladies, be a lady. Act like a lady. Dress like a lady. Talk like a lady. And learn to be in subjection to your own husband. Then Proverbs chapter 17, look at verse number 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. Now here when he says covereth a transgression seeketh love, he's not talking about covering up like a cover up. Oh, somebody did something major. Let's just cover it up. Pretend it didn't happen. Scoop it under the rug. Hide it. We don't want the news to find out. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about if you offend me, if you did something I didn't like, if you said something wrong, did something wrong, and it's a transgression, if I want to seek love, if I want to love you as a brother, well then, I should cover it. I should let it slide. I shouldn't worry about it. I shouldn't make it a big deal. Like what if, what if one of the guys up here was reading the verses for us and he said a name totally wrong? You know? Never Shibboleth? <laughs> right? Now, if I love you, I'm going to cover it up. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say anything about it, right? Look at the second half of the verse. He says, But he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. He that repeateth a matter separateth very... He's talking about gossip here. So he's not talking about hiding sin and ignoring sin. When somebody offends you as a brother, if you love them and you want to keep the, the friendship and maintain the relationship, then don't go gossiping to somebody else. Brother Jake, did you hear how Brother Dale said that name? Pfft. Right? If I loved him, I'd say, hey man, I would have said it that way, but that's okay. Or I would have said nothing at all and let it go. Right? And I'm just giving that as, as one example. Think about the application in brotherly love. Think about how we ought to be treating each other as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and even in your family. If you love your wife, there are certain things you ought to just let it go and not pick a fight and not make some big blow up. Oh, well, I could have. Oh, you should have. You should have been ready. You let it go. Don't repeat it. Don't bring it back up a week later. Yeah, well, that one time I had to circle all the way around and come back because you weren't ready. I, had, I was late because of you. No, don't repeat a matter. Especially when it's, you know, gossip. Did you see what they did? Can you believe that? You want to separate yourself from your friends? Start gossiping to other people about them. Start repeating it instead of just letting it go. Instead of being willing to forgive. Instead of, you know, do you want to lose your friend or do you want to love your friend? That's really what it comes down to. Look at verse number 17 in this chapter. A friend loveth at all times. A friend loveth at most times. What's it say? A friend loveth at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. You know, when something bad happens, that's when you find out who your real friends are. Right? You ever heard the phrase, fair weather friends? <laughs> Well, it's sunny today, and I have food on my table, and everything's okay, so I guess I like you. That's not a friend. That's somebody, it's convenient for them. They like what they're getting from you, and if they ever change, you know, that's not a real friend. A friend is, man, life is down, times are tough. I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to show respect for you. I'm still going to be your friend. And it's when we go through difficult times sometimes, it shows us who our true friends are. Again, the Lord trieth the hearts. God lets us go through difficult times because sometimes we spend, 
I, I think, you know, personally, I, I think you spend more time with certain people because they're needy, because they're selfish. And meanwhile, you're not spending time with the person that's your real friend. So God says, eh, I'm going to sever that. We're going to purge a little bit. We're going to fix some stuff. We're going to try you. And a friend loveth at all times. A brother's born for adversity. Look at verse 18. A man void of understanding striketh hands and becometh surety in the presence of his friend. Now, when it talks about striking hands, he's making a deal. Making a handshake. We have a deal? Let's make a deal, right? But he's saying, a man void of understanding. Void means absent. Understanding, we're talking about wisdom. Look, if you have wisdom in your business dealings, you would not agree to something out of peer pressure. Right? You wouldn't just make a, a peer pressure promises. And I'm not talking about the, the pressure of the waves on the pier at the beach here, okay? I'm talking about when you're around your friends, when you're around acquaintances, when you're around somebody and they think you're well off, oh, well, you know, because that's what the car dealership wants to do. Well, I mean, you have such good credit. I mean, you should just go ahead and sign for it now. You can probably do it. Well, yeah, I do. I mean, well, I don't know. Can I? I mean, what they want to do is back you in a corner. He's warning here, though, a man avoid of understanding striketh hands and becometh surety in the presence of a friend. Yeah, I should go ahead and buy that. I deserve that, don't I? Right? That's peer pressure. That's, you know, that's not being bold enough to say it's not wise to move forward. I need to stop. I need to think. I need to pray. I need to, uh, you know take status of my of my flocks you know we need to search the truth out before we agree to something but i think the real message here is do not forswear yourself do not be eager to forswear yourself just as much as somebody said hey you coming over tomorrow lord willing if you yes i promise well be careful lord willing i'll do my best i intend to lord willing i plan on it right be careful about forswearing yourself and especially in financial matters Especially when there's pressure from other people. If you ever feel somebody giving you pressure about buying something, you need to just stop and not do it. One of our neighbors, they recently bought a house. And then a few months later, they buy solar. And then I see, one, I see the, the uh, water filter company van pull up. And I'm thinking, young couple, they have credit, and they can't say no. So they're, yeah, they're getting clobbered, but it won't take long and they're going to be overextended. You know, you know the, the water filter company probably promised them, we're going to give you so much free soap that this water will be free. It won't even cost anything. And now here they are with a hundred dollar a month bill and they don't know how to pay it. And listen, don't agree to something. Don't forswear to something. If it's a, if it's a deal tonight, it's a deal tomorrow. If it's, if it's a value today, it's a value next week. And there are times where you feel pressure, whether, you know, you go to a pawn shop looking for a tool, or you go to the flea market and you're looking at stuff and you're like, man, this is the right price, it's the right, I'm just not sure. Let it go. Don't fall in love with it, you know. We shouldn't fall in love with property or tools or cars. There's certain things that people want to try to pressure you to agree to and, and you end up destroying yourself financially. So that's a, this is a really wise thing that he's saying here, not becoming surety. A man void of understanding, strike at hands, become surety. If you have some wisdom, then you will think it out. You'll pray about it. You know, and listen, men, it's your decision. The bills are your decision. The income is your decision. But you ought to ask your wife. You have to live with her. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. And I've seen salesmen try to, to, to fault men for saying, well, I'm going to ask my wife, well, who's the boss? Well, who wears the pants? Is she in charge? Well, no, but I live with her. And I love her, and we're a team, so I'm going to ask her opinion about the item, the color, the placement, whatever. You know, I'm not just going to make a decision without giving her a chance because I love her enough to give her that option. Think about it. Look at verse number 21 in this chapter. Proverbs 17, 21. He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. This is the warning. You don't want to beget a fool. You don't want your children to be raised as fools. You don't want your children to be like these spoiled rich kids that don't know how to fend for themselves. All they know is to say, I want, I want, I want. You know, and a lot of, a lot of your public school rejects, a lot of the kids that can't even pass an entrance exam, right? Why? Because nobody cared enough. Nobody loved them enough to sit down and help them, to actually teach them anything. Not my responsibility. The government has a program for my children. 
why do, you, why do children grow up in a Christian home and not get saved? Because mom and dad never sat down with them and confirmed these things and talked about them. Well, they're at Sunday school. I sent them to Sunday school. Well, how come they don't know how to do math? I don't know. I sent them to public school. I, I did my part. I put them on the bus. I bought them a backpack. I did everything I could for them. Look, that's a wicked heart. And then you raise a fool, and it's a shame. It says, He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his own sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. Boy, there are a lot of grandparents today that look, I don't know how they got this way. I've heard a lot that we're conservative, but I don't know why they're voting with all those liberals. Well, that's where you sent them to the herd, and the herd's moving that way, and so that's what they don't. Now they think abortion's okay, and being queer, and having purple hair, and all that kind of stuff. They don't want a family. Which, some of, these, some of these fools, it's probably a good thing they're not reproducing because that's just another generation of fools. Look at verse 25. A fool, we're going to come back to 22, but look at verse 25 here. He says, A foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her that bear him. The world hates their children. Newsflash, they hate them. When they let a child yell at them, I've seen it in the grocery store too many times, when a little child is yelling and I mean just almost you might as well cuss your mama because there's hatred it's just what can I get out of you what you know leave me alone I want it my way Proverbs 13 he says he that spareth the rod hateth his son but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes if you love your child you're going to correct them instruct them and show them the right path if not we'll just let them go out the door hey uh, be good at school don't do any heroin good luck with that one uh, if anybody tries to get you to buy drugs, please say no. Don't watch any vulgarity on their phones. If they show you a knife or a gun, please don't touch it. I don't want to have to answer that phone call. That's not love. That's not love at all. Proverbs 29, he says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. A child left to the public school brings his mother to shame. A child left even to Sunday school. I've seen it too many times now out knocking doors where parents don't even know if their children are saved. They have no clue. Well, we went and I heard the motivational message and the kid got some candy and they colored and they sang about Jesus and I don't know if they're saved. I don't know what they believe about Jesus. I don't even know if they believe that he's God. That's a shame on those parents. They don't love them if they're not making sure. It brings them to shame. A bitterness to her that bear him, it says in 25. A bitterness to her that bear him. That's how a lot of mamas feel about their children today because they don't understand why they're ending up the way that they have, but yet they've let the devil program them through the music, through the movies. Look at verse 22. This will be the last one tonight. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Merry heart doeth good like a medicine. When I was a kid, this was a song. We, we sang this as a, as a song. Having a good heart, having a happy heart, is like medicine. But a down spirit, a broken spirit, dryeth the bones. Literally, God again is comparing the, the power of your, your attitude or the power of your words over your own health, but also other, uh, over others. You know, the, the, one of my favorite Proverbs, there's power of death and life in the tongue. And they that love the fruit of it, shall, they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. If you love speaking death into people, well, you will reap that fruit. If you love speaking life into people and encouraging them and edifying them and lifting them up, that's the fruit that you will reap. So here, when he says a merry heart, doeth good like a medicine. If you would encourage yourself in the Lord, and just be thankful for what you have instead of finding a reason to have a broken spirit and be down. Because listen, we're all going to have up and down moments, right? I, I am 90 some percent of the time, I am a merry spirit. I'm happy. I'm thankful for what God's given me. And every now and then I'll be like, I don't know, man. And I, hopefully that's the day you have a merry spirit. You're able to lift me up and encourage me. And that's the way it ought to be. But don't be that guy that's always negative or a negative Nancy. She's always, you know, talking bad. Here he's saying it's medicine. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Your mouth can affect you. It will affect your attitude. It will affect your perspective. We need to sing unto the Lord. We need to be thankful for what we have. But it will also affect others. It will affect everyone around you. And that's what we don't see. If you're all, how was work? Oh, it's again. 
My boss, you wouldn't believe this job they sent me to. It was miserable. And your wife is there trying to encourage you, then you're dumping all this negative on her. Yeah. You ought to just forget about all that stuff, leave it at the doorstep. It was great. Good to see you. What smells so good in here? Oh, is it dinner or you? you know? <laughs> oh, it's the flowers I brought you, right? Try to be smooth, right? But look, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. You want to have a happy, healthy family? Starts in here. It's in your heart. Look, God is so good to us. He has been so good. We have power over our own life. It's like medicine in our life. And, and we have that med power of medicine over our children, over our extended family. That's why I say, you have in-laws that aren't saved. Don't always be negative to them. Don't always be negative. Don't always tear them down. Don't be like, well, if you'd ever get it right, you know. No, man, hey, you know, speak life into them. Build them up. Encourage them. And there's going to come a day they'll say, man, I don't know how you always do it, but you, you, why do you always have a smile? Because I've been forgiving them so much. Because I've been given the privilege to be able to go out and see others saved. Go to Proverbs 15. Jump back to Proverbs 15 real quick. I want to tie this in with a, a merry heart. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. But a broken spirit dryeth the bones. Thank God that He has healed our church. Thank God for the blessings He's given us. Amen. Thank God He's just helping us to move forward. Who cares what the rest of the world's going to do? We're independent. We answer to God. We depend on one, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And He's taking care of business. Look at Proverbs chapter 15. Look at verse number 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit, the spirit is broken. There's a time to be sorry, and there's a time to weep and to mourn, but you also have to get past that. Never take mourning away from somebody. You know, we should weep with those that weep and mourn with those that mourn, but then it's time to encourage them and get them up, and don't stay in that state forever. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. Look at verse 14. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge. But the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. Don't worry about their foolishness. Our heart is seeking for understanding. Right? Get back to your own Bible study if you've gotten off course of that. Get back to your own daily Bible reading if you've, if you've got, you know. Get back to the memorization, the singing, the Psalms. Verse 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil. Right? Oh me. Oh my. Oh, it's just terrible. Well, I'm sorry. I don't want to live like that. But he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Even if it's a dry morsel, it's a continual feast. Look at verse 16. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. And that's just like the verse we started with. We said better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith. That's the goal, is to have a peaceful house, security in our house, to have a pleasant life instead of a house full of strife. He said then great treasure and trouble therewith. Verse 17. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. What's for dinner? Just salad. I love you. Merry heart. That's good enough. Instead of, where's the steak? You, you should have fixed it. Where's the steak? And having hatred. That's what the world has. And you can do without the steak. You can do without the hatred. You want a cheerful countenance. You want a merry heart. Seek after the Lord's wisdom. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge. The goal is here, don't get off track. Focus. It's time to repair. It's time to rebuild. It's time to start considering the grandchildren that aren't here yet. You've got to have a merry heart to get them where they need to be. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the positive words out of Proverbs 17. Lord, I pray that you would help us to just regain our focus and live for you. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless us with more souls saved and uh, just more victories in life. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.